Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Aquarium's Online Academy. My name is Luke, joining you here from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And the episode we have today is really, really interesting. It's all about birds. We, what, what do we call this? Birds from puffins to penguins? But don't worry, we're going to be talking not just about birds with names that start with P, but we'll also be talking at very least with, about some birds that have names that start with L and possibly other letters of the alphabet as well. So we're going to cover a lot of territory. Uh, and we're going to talk about a lot of the birds we have here at the aquarium and really compare the different kinds of body types and adaptations that have allowed birds to live in so many different kinds of environments and have such totally different kinds of lifestyles and behaviors and food sources and so on. So throughout this program, as I'm doing all this exploration, we're going to be looking at different webcams, different footage of different birds in our exhibits, maybe even from some stuff from outside the aquarium if we get some questions that uh, makes us want to go looking for it. And of course, as with all of our Aquarium Online Academy programs, you can watch, I'm um, sorry, you can contact us to ask questions directly via our text chain. If you just go text your questions to 562-286-1838. Again, that's 562-286-1838. We have Stewie answering questions on the, uh, on the text. He's manning the computer. Uh, you may have seen him just last program uh, teaching. This time, last time I was the one answering the questions. Now Stewie's answering the questions and he's passing a lot of them on to me. So if you give your name and your school or where you're contacting us from, assuming your parents and you are okay with that, we'll be happy to give you a shout out here on the air. And remember, of course, normal data and texting rates and all that applies. So again, if you want to text us your questions, you can 562-286-1838. And that number is going to be popping up at the bottom of the screen pretty regularly. So uh, write it down if you can now. But if not, don't worry. It'll come back. And also, if you're watching this after the fact, it's, if it's not live, you can also email us at live at lbaop.org. So we only monitor the texts during the show. But if you, want to, if you have a question later and you want to email us, we will get back to you with an answer. And you can email us at live at lbaop.org. Now let's start our show today by having a look at... Let's, let's see, what's the most sort of normal bird we've got in our collection at the aquarium? I guess maybe, I don't know. Dana, what do you think? Dana's man in the, uh, man in the behind the scenes stuff today. The pigeon guillemot, sure. Let's go look at a, a fairly conventional coastal bird. Uh, looks a lot like a pigeon. This is why we call it the pigeon guillemot. Um, now, what about this bird makes it similar, makes it look normal, I guess, to us, right? Um, let's have a look at some of the adaptations we see on this bird. Well, for one thing, right, it looks like a pigeon. That's why they call it the pigeon guillemot, even though it's not actually a pigeon. Um, and so some of the adaptations that, you know, you can see here, um, just like most birds that we're probably familiar right, with, right, the pigeon guillemot has, of course, nice big wings that allow it to fly. And there's, if, although they're not stretched out here, there's long flight feathers on those wings. Has smaller feathers covering most of its body. As a uh, pretty pretty standard, you know, sort of pigeony looking beak here, right? And of course, it's already starting to sound silly to me that I'm saying this is a normal bird or a bird that looks average or anything like that, because that's really just based on the birds that I happen to see around every day of my life. If you live here in the U.S., you're probably pretty familiar with pigeons, so a bird that looks like a pigeon probably seems pretty normal to you. But if you're in another country, it might be totally different. If you're say joining us from Australia. A bird that looks normal to you might be something more like a lorikeet. And by the way, you'll notice this pigeon, this pigeon guillemot ain't quite like your average pigeon because it's got, it's got webbed feet. Like I said, not really a pigeon. But let's look at the lorikeets. If you were in Australia or somewhere in the southwestern Pacific, lorikeets might be pretty familiar to you. Let's bring some of them up. Now, this might be a normal bird if you come from more of that area of the world. Lorikeets, although for, for us though here in the U.S., look like a very spectacular, very exotic bird. And um, I love how they, they always look a little bit grumpy to me, by the way. This is just the entire parrot family has that kind of look. where They're just like <laughs> sitting there all day long with that, on <laughs> that look on their faces. But uh, that's just how they look. That's not, really, uh, that's not really how they feel. But lorikeets, you know, in contrast to the kinds of pigeons and things that we'd find normal here in the U.S. or sparrows and stuff like that, lorikeets, not that they don't have more, less colorful birds in Australia, but lorikeets have really, really bright colorations. These are a member of the parrot family. And so these colors help them to, from certain angles, if they show the green part of their body, they blend in with the green leaves and stuff of the trees and stuff that they hide in and the grass and so on. Uh, other parts of their body, they have really spectacular colorations that help to attract mates. 
It might help them to blend in with things like flowers and other kind of more colorful stuff to camouflage against. And you'll also notice that the beaks and feet on these birds are different from the last bird we looked at. Now, if you've watched our previous episodes of Online Academy, you've probably learned that by looking at an animal's body, especially certain parts of it, things like the mouth and things like the feet and things like kind of the shapes that you see on the body, you can learn a lot about what that animal is able to do and then start to make some, some kind of inferences, some deductions on what it might be able to eat, how it might live its life. So as we look at different birds over the next few, over the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to start talking about what maybe the things we can see on these animals tell us about how it is that they might be able to live. So to begin with, we'll start with the lorikeet here, I guess, and then maybe we'll go back to the guillemot in a second. But these lorikeets, let's have a look at their beaks. Now, what kind of things do you think you could eat if you had a beak like that? Here's another view. Oh, and this is showing the tongue too, which is going to be important in a second. Now, lorikeets have a have a beak that you know is pretty pretty similar to the beaks you see on most parrots, right? Bar parrots tend to have this beak with this kind of hooked bill on top. It tends to be pretty broad. If you've ever if you've ever had a pet parrot or been bitten by one, you know that it's pretty sharp. I have been bitten by birds, including by by a couple of cantankerous lorikeets on quite a few occasions in my life. And <laughs> the uh, the thing about the lorikeet though is right when you look at that kind of a beak, oftentimes people associate parrots with like eating nuts and stuff like that. And that's generally true. Most parrots are nut eaters and tend to, tend to crack them open and eat the softer insides and stuff. Lorikeets, though, are a little bit interesting because lorikeets do use their beak to tear open certain food items. But lorikeets are weird among the parrots because they have an extra adaptation that allows them to live mostly off of consuming liquids and pulp and soft stuff like that. Because although you can't see it too well on this lorikeet's tongue because it's wet, lorikeets have a brush on their tongue. Now, most, par most birds and certainly most parrots do not have this, right? But lorikeets, what they do, instead of eating hard seeds, they actually spend most of their time basically finding fruits and, and, and flowers with nectar and stuff like that and, getting them op and opening them up and kind of getting all the liquids out from the inside. Lorikeets have, although they have a, bur a body more like a, a body of a parrot and a beak like a seed-eating bird like other parrots do, their diet is actually a lot more like that of a hummingbird or something like that. They have a really, really interesting way of living. So this is actually kind of a counterexample that sometimes you can look at an animal and think you understand exactly how it lives, but, but only, a, only a, close, a closer look might reveal a little bit more. But in general, though, if you do see a bird with a beak like this, it's probably doing things like tearing open seeds and stuff, unless, of course, it's some sort of bird of prey, like a hawk or a falcon or an eagle or an owl, in which case that usually means that they're using that beak to tear through stuff like say, small animals that they eat and things like that. Or an albatross. Now, another uh, thing about the lorikeet, this is a really easy one, and this really does tell you something. Pretty much any bird you're looking at, when you look at its feet, it tells you a lot about what that bird can probably do with those feet. When you look at these feet, you think, oh, this bird likes to go swimming. Yep, this lorikeet, it's a swimmer, right? No, it's not a swimmer at all. The lorikeets, although they do bathe themselves every once in a while, I have never seen one go for a swim. Because lorikeets don't have any of the adaptations that a water bird would need to have, right? They don't have webbed feet. Uh, their feathers are not, although their feathers probably help to keep water off them a little bit, if they were completely submerged, I don't think they'd do that good of a job. Well, lorikeets get wet pretty fast when they take baths. And so this body type doesn't, isn't, isn't dedicated toward any kind of swimming behavior. But let's go back to that, that guillemot we were looking at, the pigeon guillemot. And uh, then we'll maybe look at some of our other diving birds as well. Now this bird, you can tell right away when you look at this bird that this is, even though it looks kind of like a pigeon, is not really a pigeon in spite of its name. The pigeon guillemot is a guillemot, which is a kind of bird, which is a family of birds that looks kind of like a pigeon. Now, as you look at its feet, when you see feet like this at a bird, that can mean only one thing, really, and that means that that is a bird that likes to spend its time in the water. Now, not all webbed feet on birds are created equal. Some birds have webbed feet that are webbed in different ways or more, kind of more webbed or less webbed. And also, there are some water birds that don't really have webbed feet. But the, for the most part, if you see this, it definitely means that's a water-bound bird. So I guess I could say that if a bird doesn't have webbed feet, that doesn't mean it 100% never goes in the water. But if a bird has webbed feet, you can be darn sure that bird spends time in the water. Now, we're starting to get our first questions 
Uh, Alyssa and Haley are asking, what's the difference from, between penguins and puffins? So well, let's actually start with that, because we talked about the body type of a bird like a lorikeet that spends its time in trees, you know, feeding on, in the lorikeet's case, fruits and nectar, but in the case of other parrots and things like nuts and stuff like that. Now let's start to look at the kinds of bodies that allow animals to live, allow birds to live in the water. So the, the pigeon guillemot is somewhat adapted for the water, does spend a lot of time living in the water as its feet attest. But there are birds that are, that are, but it's also a bird that can still fly and is still pretty effective at it. Uh, let's look at some other birds that maybe are totally adapted for the water, or even more so. Okay, so here's, this is gonna be my, this is gonna be my halfway case here, but, but that's all right, we can keep going. So you asked about puffins. So this is one of our puffin species that we have here at the aquarium. Now again, those wet feet show you that you've got a bird that lives in the water. Uh, puffins generally hang out on cliffs, lay their, eggs on, lay, lay their eggs on coastal cliffs and stuff like that. If you've ever been in the North Atlantic, you've probably seen quite a few of them, or the North Pacific, I believe they have them too. And this puffin also has a beak that is much bigger than the one we saw in the guillemot, right? This beak is really, really good for catching fish. Puffins are excellent at chasing things around under the water and will usually and will catch fish in their beaks. So although this bird can fly, they do their hunting while they swim. So this is a bird that's starting to move toward a much more, toward a much more water-bound lifestyle. And then you asked Alyssa and Haley, what's the difference between penguins and puffins? Well, let's bring up a penguin and let's see some differences. So if we bring up the penguins, ooh, what are these, king penguins? Or, I don't think they're emperors. Oh, kings? Yeah, these are kings. All right, so the emperor penguin is the biggest of all the penguins. The king penguin's like the next one down. They look very similar. Um, so the king penguins here. Now, do you think these, these three are going to be uh, taken off and soaring through the sky anytime soon? No, I don't think so. The penguin is a bird that has become totally specialized toward doing most of its activities in the water. Now, penguins do spend a significant amount of time on land during the breeding season and when they're molting, but as far as hunting and all these other things that they do, they do this, all that stuff in the water and their bodies show, their bodies are a testament to that. These wings don't have the kinds of flight feathers that would allow these penguins to be able to take off and fly. And if you look at their bodies, their bodies don't have that sort of graceful light look to them that other birds' bodies have, right? Birds are able to fly for several different reasons. The most important is the possession of wings with those feathers that give them lift. But also a lot of other birds have, have, have evolved to have bodies that are really, really lightweight. Even their bones are relatively hollow in most birds. But in penguins, their body is a lot plumper and also their bones are denser. So they're really, they're really, in, they really have developed and evolved to live in the water and swim in the water. But when they do get under the water, penguins are really, really, really fast moving and are very, very effective hunters. But the... Um, Biggest difference to answer your question, Alyssa and Haley, what's the difference between penguins and puffins? Well, there's a lot of differences. Puffins, for one thing, can fly. Penguins cannot. Puffins have a different shape of beak. And, of course, there's different kinds of puffins and different kinds of penguins, so there's some variation there. But you can see here that this beak is much kind of broader and taller, a little bit fatter than those thin beaks you saw on the penguins. But it really does vary. And those, be those different beaks, when you really get down to the subtleties of it, show you the differences in how those animals might be using those beaks, what specific kinds of ways they're catching food, and also those those, the adaptations that help these, these animals to catch their food, that help puffins and penguins to catch food, don't just show on the outside of their beak, they also show on the inside of their mouth. Penguins, for example, have basically spikes inside their mouth that point down, so once they grab onto a fish and start to swallow it, the fish has a really hard time swimming out and basically can't escape. Now we got another question from Charlotte, are puffins endangered? On the West Coast, they are not. In the Atlantic, they're what we call vulnerable. And basically, this is, basically that means that they're not, they're not considered super endangered. They're not something we're worried is going to go extinct like right away or anything. But when an animal is vulnerable, it means their populations have been shrinking and they're not as common as they used to be. And this has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with a loss of habitat. And the more people there are along the coast, the more development we do, the less habitat there is for puffins. But also, a lot of the food that these animals depend upon is being eaten by us now. So we have to be careful about how much fishing we do to make sure that we leave enough food behind for the, all the natural wildlife that depends on it, too. Now, Alexandria from Cerritos had another question. Do penguins eat anything besides fish? Here at the aquarium, I think we pretty much exclusively feed them fish, but I would not be surprised 
if penguins catch a squid or two from time to time. I don't know, but I'd be... Uh, yeah, I... And there's also krill-eating penguins. Well, here, is that like, what, does the fairy penguin do that? Like the little ones? So, yeah, so uh, Stewie is actually telling me this one. So some of the small-beaked penguins, such as the Adeli here, oh, I guess you can kind of tell, um, will use that very tiny beak in order to consume krill. So, again, the beak tells you a lot about what the animal is going after. So if you see a penguin with a small, small beak, that might be more of a krill eater, whereas the big-beaked penguins are more interested in eating fish. Now, we're getting a lot of other good questions. Ooh, Gage from Arizona. How many herring? Nice to talk to you again, Gage. And it's good to see so many of you joining our programs over, over and over again and answering a lot of the same questions, a lot of questions from some of the same kids. This is cool. So how many herring can a puffin eat in a day? Wow. I don't know, Gage. I'll have to see if Stewie can figure that out, can ask, can ask around and find out. They eat, they eat a lot, but I don't know if it's, it's not, it's not like the mouths that like otters eat. You know how we talk about, when we talk about how much an animal eats, oftentimes it's easy to think of it, it's best to describe it in terms of what percentage of its own body weight it consumes every day. So, so, so if you give an idea, to give you an idea of what that means, like, you know, so humans eat, we tend to eat five or six percent of our body weight in food every day. Um, seals and sea lions is more like seven or eight percent. Otters, it's like 25 percent. Birds, it's pretty high, but I don't think it's otter high. Um, but I don't know, I've seen those puffins wolf down, yeah, five or six of them at a time. So they, they, they have healthy appetites. You know, a misconception people have about birds is that they don't eat that much. Birds actually have pretty big appetites and actually do eat quite a lot. It's just that a lot of birds are messy eaters, so it looks like they're not actually eating a lot of food. But in actuality, they do. And our penguins, we've seen them wolf down 10 or 12 sardines at once. So the appetites on seabirds are very high. And it makes sense because if they're swimming around and you know, they're using a lot of calories swimming through the water, much more than you would need to use moving through the air, also that water they're living in is usually pretty cold. So in order to keep their body temperature up, they're going to need to generate a lot of heat, which means they've got to get those calories somewhere and they've got to eat a lot more food. But the specifics, I don't know exactly how much a a uh, puffin eats every day. I'd have to ask our husbandry staff. Now, Valentina from Rancho Cucamonga. Oh, hello again, Valentina. Said, where do lorikeets get food in the wild? Very good question. So if we can bring that lorikeet back up. As I was mentioning, you now here's two of our Swainson's lorikeets here. There's a lot of different kinds of lorikeets. Um, that beak allows them to feed on things like fruit and nectar and flowers. So they look in trees. They look in, br they look in bushes and stuff like that. And they've, by the way, I've heard in parts of Australia, lorikeets are considered a little bit of a pest because they behave a lot like pigeons and they oftentimes will hang out around places that people like to go, like restaurants and stuff outside. And uh, they'll just fly in and try and take over the place, seeing if there's any, you know, any nice foods they can grab around. And uh, unlike pigeons, they are extremely noisy. So, so some Australians I've met aren't that fond of lorikeets, but we love them here at the aquarium. Ooh, we have them making noise. Let's hear lorikeets making noise. I can actually hear them through the door right now, even though we're just here to play. So, here's some of our lorikeets. Now, those noises aren't that loud. Probably, well, maybe, I don't know, they might be, depending on how much volume you've got turned up on your computer. But you can imagine if a few thousand of these decided to, you know, fly in while you were having lunch one day, it would, uh, it would be a bit distracting, wouldn't it? Now, Hector had another really good question. How long do penguins live? Now, that varies depending on the penguin, but Magellanic penguins, that's the species we have here at the aquarium, live 20 or 30 years. And actually, since we're talking about birds in general, birds oftentimes have really long lifespans. A lot of parrots can live lifespans similar to that of a human. Our cockatoo Lola, for example, he might, excuse me, he might live, he might live 70 or 80 years or maybe even longer. There have even been parrots that lived over 100 years. We have some more questions about this. So what uh, Alan from Park Avenue School asked, what's the largest bird and what's the smallest bird? The largest bird is everybody's favorite, the ostrich, that big goofy bird <laughs> that uh, can get up to nine feet tall, coming at about 250 pounds. The smallest bird, and this is uh, one that very, very few people get to see. It's hard to even find a picture of this bird. Lives, if I remember correctly, in Cuba, doesn't it? I think so. Uh, that bird is the bee hummingbird. And it's about two and a quarter inches long, and it weighs, get this, three one thousandths of a pound. So this is a bird that's about a little bit larger than, you know, maybe that big. 
And that bee hummingbird is one of the uh, one of the smallest of the full-grown vertebrates too. Yeah, there's there's rodents and stuff that are smaller, and there's fish that are smaller, but it's a teeny tiny little little vertebrate, uh, close to the bottom of how how small vertebrates can get. And let's go look again at a few other things about our birds before we wrap up. Let's talk more about our Magellanic penguins. I wonder what they're up to in their uh, on their uh, live feeds right now. Let's go have a look. Let's see here. So if you want to check out our birds at any time, you can always check out the live feeds. Our penguin exhibit actually has a couple of different live feeds. And this is a cool time to be looking because right now the penguins are starting their nesting season. So you'll notice they've got, if you, if you look in the exhibit on either the wide angle or the closer up views, we, we're kind of, we got a little bit zoomed in right now. They have these nest holes that they go into to lay their eggs. We give them basically like sticks and grass and stuff. They build a nest in there out of it. And that's what this kind of penguin naturally does. People tend to get confused about penguins because you might have, if you've seen a movie like, uh, what was it, March of the Penguins, for example, you know that, you know, emperor penguins, they raise their eggs on their feet, right? They have, they, but that's a really, really, really dangerous way to raise an egg. And emperor penguins are the, so far as I know, the only ones that do it exclusively that way. But other penguins tend to build nests either underneath things or in holes, or sometimes they'll make a nest in the sand. It depends on the type of penguin. But our Magellanic penguins like to dig their, dig their nests underneath things, in either, either in holes in a cliff face or in places like underneath a bush or underneath a rock, because that helps to protect their eggs from the hot sun. and also makes it so that the parents can more easily control the temperature inside the nest. Now, we have a few more questions. Kyle's asking if we can see an emperor penguin. We'll see if we can bring one up. We have to find a photograph or footage we can use. But this is really cool. This is inside one of the nests. This is a nest cam. And it looks like we're looking at the rump of a grown-up penguin right now, I think. So these penguins, they like to uh, basically, a lot of the time, they'll just, they'll basically just guard their nest and they'll have their head sticking out and just seeing if anything's coming. And they get pretty feisty if you interfere with their nests. So we, we are a little bit more careful this time at, the, at this time of the year about how we interact with them because we don't want them to feel like we're threatening their nests at all. But our staff still have to go in there and feed them and all that sort of thing. Um, and here is the emperor penguin. So remember how I was looking at those king penguins and I was like, those are kings, right? The reason why I thought so, here's some king penguins here, is because king penguins look a lot like emperors, as you can see, but the emperors are so much more plump. So you can really tell when you're looking at an emperor that this is a bird that is hanging out in some place that is cold uh, because they don't, uh, they have this real, they have this body that's very, very robust, very kind of thick. And that, 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 that is essentially blubber, really. You know, you've heard about blubber and marine mammals, but penguins basically have developed blubber independently. And in, the, in combination with those close cropped, oily, insulating feathers, that blubber allows these emperor penguins to live in the, well, one of the coldest places on the planet. They, these birds lay their eggs in Antarctica. I mean, who would think, oh, you know what? We have, we have to lay our eggs. Where should we do it? How about Antarctica? But that's what the emperor penguins do. And uh, because they are going into a place in Antarctica that has basically no land predators at all, actually it has no land predators at all, um, this allows these birds to be able to really just spend months of the year just focusing on their eggs. They get themselves nice and kind of fattened up by eating a lot of food, and then they go and they guard the eggs, they hold them on their feet, and they're, again, the only penguin that doesn't do any nest building at all. And here, by the way, since we're talking a lot about penguins, is a map of the range of all the penguins. So our penguins, the ones we have here at the aquarium, are, are Magellanic penguins, and they come from, their nesting grounds are down here at the southern tip of South America in a region called Patagonia and some of the islands and stuff around there. And then when they nest, they hang out down here, but then when they go hunting, they go actually a little farther north. And you've also got Galapagos penguins. You've got down in Antarctica, you've got emperor penguins and king penguins. And what else is that? Is it the gentoos that also hang out down there, if I remember correctly? And then in South Africa, you've got the close cousins of the Magellanic penguins, the other chinstrap penguins. In Australia, you've got the little blue, also known as the fairy penguin, and also in New Zealand. So there's a lot, there actually are quite a few different penguin species. There's 17 different kinds of penguins. And as you can see, they pretty much all live in the Southern Hemisphere. 
so the only one that occasionally goes north is the Galapagos penguin. Sometimes they, they do cross the equator, but that's, that's about it. Uh, we have some more questions that have come in. We had another question from, uh, I think, oh, actually, did I answer this one already? From how long do penguins live? They live 20 or 30 years in the case of the Magellanic penguins. The other species, I'd be willing to bet that some live a little less, some live a little longer. Um, let's see here. Avalon had, have any penguins escaped? Oh, good question. So Avalon, no penguin has ever escaped from us here at the aquarium. Whether or not a penguin has escaped from some other facility, I, I can't answer that one. I don't know. But uh, I will tell you that as birds go, penguins are not the best escape artists uh, and are, are fairly easy to catch. You just want to make sure that you don't make them angry while you're doing it. But our penguins have... Uh, our penguins have never shown any, any interest in escaping. We uh, take them on walks out and about the aquarium from time to time, and they always come right back to us. They don't seem to, uh, they don't seem to mind it too much. Um, another question, Natalia asked, do penguins protect the baby or the egg or both? And also Elvis asked a, a related question, how do penguins make their nests? So as I've been saying a couple times already, Elvis, the penguins make nests right in different ways. Some of them dig holes. Some of them build a pile of rocks and so on. Uh, we have a Magellanic nest. Okay, so here's an example of a Magellanic penguin's nest in nature. You can see there's a hole that they've dug there, nice kind of wet soil here, and they bring sticks and grass and stuff in there. But other penguins just, again, the emperor penguin just nests on its feet. So it really depends depending on the kind of penguin. But Natalia, your question, do they protect the baby or the egg or both? They usually protect both, at least for a while. So, and actually, I'm sorry, they definitely protect both at least for a while. They protect the egg, to make sure that the egg stays warm and is correctly is carefully insulated. And then when the baby hatches out of that egg, it's totally helpless. This is, so far as I know, every, the, true of every single bird species. Birds, when they come out of their eggs, they haven't got their feathers in yet. They don't have, or at least not all of them, they haven't got the ability to feed themselves. So birds, of course, as you've probably seen, feed their babies by regurgitating food into their mouths which seems real gross to us humans, but if you're a penguin, it seems, if you're a bird, it seems normal. <laughs> and as they, as they do that, they also have to, of course, protect their babies as best they can. Now, there are predators that'll try to come around and try to grab some of those eggs and some of those babies in some places. Uh, usually those predators are other birds, though in some parts of their range, it might be things like, it might be coastal mammals and, and reptiles and stuff like that too. But it really depends on what, where you live. If, you live. if you're in Antarctica and you're on the land, you have almost nothing to worry about. If you live in, except for maybe the occasional bird of prey, if you live in South America or Africa or Australia, those penguins definitely do have to worry about predators. And here's a picture by the, oh, your baby penguin. Oh, look at you. Okay, so this is a picture of one of our baby penguins. You can see when they're first born, this is not an animal that's going to go off and take care of itself right away. It hasn't got all of its feathers. It's just a little bit fuzzy. They need to be taken care of and helped to grow for quite a while, but you'd be surprised how quickly they become self-sufficient. In just a few months, they're pretty much ready to go and live their own life. And here are the juveniles here. So once they get their feathers in, you can tell they're not, they're not full-grown adults yet because their feathers look a little different. They don't have those hard lines between the white and black parts of their body like the adults do. But nonetheless, they, uh, they're, they're pretty much able to go out and hunt on their own at that, at that point. And then I had another question. Lily asked, how many lorikeets do we have here at the aquarium? We have over 100 lorikeets at the aquarium. And uh, they reproduce here. There's three main types that we have here. Those are the Edwards, the Swainsons, and the green naped rainbow lorikeet. These are all three subspecies of the rainbow lorikeet. And this is just a few of the Lorian lorikeet species that exist in the world. There's something like 60 species in this family of birds that, that is the lorikeets and the lories, which is just bigger lorikeets. And we have only a couple minutes left, so I think we've got a couple more questions here. Lincoln from Santa Cl Clarita asked, what's my favorite bird? Oh my gosh, that's a hard one. Uh, my favorite bird, oh wow. Um, I don't know, I always say I don't believe in favorites. Um, but, well, toucans are pretty great. I'm a pretty big fan of toucans because they're so ridiculous. I mean, that giant beak, it seems so unnecessary, but they, they, but they have it. Also, you know, emus, emus are a crack up. If you ever get a chance to hang out with an emu, you know, just don't get too close because they're mean, but they're pretty funny. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of great parrots, too. I'm a fan of a lot of birds. That's a very good question, Lincoln. Um, what's your favorite bird? Now, I think we're almost out of questions and almost out of time. So I want to just re recap before we end. Remember that as you look at different kinds of birds, 
Their bodies tell you a lot about how they live and what they can do and what they, what they need in their environment. And sometimes these things are really easy to tell. You can tell whether a bird, you can generally tell whether a bird can fly or not, right? You can tell whether a bird is a swimmer or not almost all the time. Um, but sometimes things can be a little bit harder and you have to look a little closer and uh, ask more questions. And as we saw with the lorikeets, right, where the beak looks like they'd eat seeds, but actually if that particular kind of bird, they are more into eating things that are softer than that. So there really is a lot of amazing things to explore and learn about with birds. And I hope you'll uh, be able to come visit us someday here at the aquarium, I hope someday in the not too distant future, and look at our birds here in person and do some of that exploration yourself. In the meantime, if you want to check out the birds that we have, we have a webcam in our penguin exhibit, a couple different webcams in the nests. We have one under the water. We also have one on the land. So if you want to check that out, please do. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and will join us again when we return for Aquarium's Online Academy at 1 o'clock. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye.